guy was probably worth probably billions or at least hundreds of millions and pulls up and you know, his crazy car, $10,000 suit, all this. And I'm just like, cool, I'm gonna get a job. I'm gonna work my way up. At the end of the meeting, he's like, do you know how to paint pictures, like walls? Like, hey, he's like, you know how to paint walls? And I'm like, yeah, like I know a little bit. He's like, well, that's the only job we have. If you know how to paint, you can, you can work here, but we don't have anything else. And I literally at that moment was like, I'm never working for anyone again in my life. Welcome to the Lubo Smith Podcast. I'm your host, Lubo, co-founder and CEO of SCRV. Here to talk to the industry leaders from the tech and startup space and ask them about their tips and tricks they use to operate at the top of the game. Today, I'm happy to welcome Andrew Patkash founder of Profluent Sports, sports media powerhouse and investment fund all under one roof. Andrew is man of many hats. He has been an athlete, creator, founder, investor. He has pretty much tried all of that and he is now combining it in Profluent Sports that he launched in 2021. In this episode, Andrew shares what it's like to do a transition from being a college athlete to a sports entrepreneur. And he also mentions what motivates him to be building an informed sports community with no bullshit. So let's dive into the discussion. And we are rolling. Welcome, Andrew. We both appreciate you having me, brother. I, like I mentioned to you before, happy to be on the other side of the, the podcast world as a guest again. So uh, thanks yeah. for having me. You mentioned you have done... Uh, uh, more than 70 episodes by now, and uh, you have not been uh, a guest uh, since starting your podcast. So we are changing things uh, uh, right now and uh, switching it up. Uh, so I love it. it yeah. Yeah. 70 uh, episodes. It's crazy, man. For anyone that doesn't know, yeah, I mean, you know very well, podcasts are awesome and there's so many great benefits, but they're also a lot of work. So, uh, you know, always be appreciative if you're ever on one of what actually <laughs> happens after the recording, because it's just the start of a long process from editing and all the, all the stuff to turn on a good final product that you listen to in your car and speed up and put on 1.5 and go, Oh, you know, why is there this ad? And it's like, if you only knew. Yeah, that's hundred percent right. And uh, you know best. So uh, we'll definitely get to that in the discussion as well. But I wanted to kick things off with uh, asking you, uh, how do you see the transition on your side happening from being an athlete to actually building a, a media company in the sports space? Uh, because that's uh, pretty much what you are after, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been a great transition for me. I uh, went from thinking of playing a fifth year in college into worked for a sports startup for a little bit. But uh, just a couple of months and then right into my own thing once I felt I had the base. But uh, it's cool. Just even athletes in general, much bigger, right? I never made it to the pros, but it's cool to see so many of them now jumping into their own media stuff as well, like the Kelsey brothers and Draymond Green. And there's just a ton of athletes now understanding the power of like, hey, I'm an athlete, but that ends. And media is a great intermingle to then what you're doing in business or whatever you like post playing days. So for me, it was a easy transition from, you know, a, a good college player into then this. But if you're like a even bigger athlete, it should be an even smoother and higher scale opportunity as well. Do you feel like it's expediting the whole thing that you suddenly uh, don't have to go through the entire life cycle to build up the following and everything? And like, if you want to do your own thing, suddenly you have a lot better chance to do so yeah i mean also as an athlete like people know you're it takes a lot to get there now some people are blessed with genetics right like even myself maybe i wasn't blessed with six seven or six eight or super you know great jumping or speed but i was still blessed to be six three six four you know a solid athlete to make it to this level but also there's a lot of work that goes into it and so as an athlete i think people perceive like, Hey, a lot of work went into getting to that level, whether it's college or pros or whatever. And so they know it's going to translate well. And that's why, even if you look at some studies, it's something like 95%. I, I, I mean, I don't know if I fully believe this, but it's like 95% of CEOs played sports or college sports or something like that. 
and it's it's an absurd number and it makes a lot of sense it's just like it takes discipline and all this to uh get to that level so the transition should be easy but a lot of people also get caught up and they like for me all i knew for 23 years of my life was basketball and so then when you wake up one day and it's like holy cow there's this three hour gap of time possibly even more that doesn't have basketball now what? So it's a it's just a little bit of a mindset shift, but the athletes that figure that out while they're still playing, much easier and better transition than trying to do it when you're done. Yeah, I feel like it must be quite difficult when you make it to be a big star and then suddenly you don't have your future really lined up and then you end your career and like there is a huge hole suddenly, right? You don't know what to do with the time. I mean, I have not been in uh, such a situation, but I can only imagine. Oh yeah, it's a it's a massive hole, and you know, lucky for me, it, it worked out fine, and and it was a quick transition because I had stuff going on in the background. But yeah, for some, I know. Yeah, I mean that's why you saw ten, fifteen, twenty years ago so many athletes going bankrupt because it was just like. Oh, I don't have, you know, a million dollars coming next month. All my sponsors are gone. Now what? <laughs> yeah. So what's been your personal breakthrough when you felt like, okay, now it's the time to actually start thinking about uh, doing something of my own. What was the what was the point at which it all happened? Yeah, I want to say even when I was really young, I always knew it'd be something on my own. My uh, parents are entrepreneurs, other people in my family, my mentors. So it was always, you know, I guess just in my uh, in my blood or DNA. And uh, it was really when I was 16, my, my one mentor, he owns a bunch of businesses, owns a bunch of real estate across Pittsburgh. And he was just taking me around to a bunch of the different ones. And I was like, this is cool. Like he controls his day. He gets to work with all different kinds of people on different projects. Like I want that. So I put it in my brain and then I went to college and, uh, when I grab, I'll skip some of the boring and gray stuff, but <laughs> I show up. So my mentor actually puts me in contact with one of the largest real estate firms in Pittsburgh. And I had a finance and real estate degree at Boston university. So good degree, you know, did well, solid grades, played basketball. You know, it's like, Oh, this is, could be a great, you know, initial, uh, I don't even know what they call it. It's like your first entry level job or whatever. Right. And, uh, he sets up a meeting, not just with like the hiring person, but the actual CEO and founder of this massive company. Like this guy is probably worth probably billions or at least hundreds of millions. And so I'm like, all right, like if he can get me to this guy, like I'm definitely getting a job. Right. So we go, it's a great meeting. This guy pulls up and you know, his crazy car, $10,000 suit, all this. And I'm just like, cool, I'm gonna get a job. I'm going to work my way up. And he goes at the end of the meeting, he's like, do you know how to paint? I'm like paint, like paint, like pictures, like walls. Like yeah. He's like, you know how to paint walls? And I'm like, yeah, like I know a little bit. He's like, well, that's the only job we have. If you know how to paint, you can, you can work here, but we don't have anything else. And I literally at that moment was like, I'm never working for anyone again in my life under someone. I'm going to build my own things and I'm going to work with cool people. And I'm not going to let that ever be the situation. So that was when I really knew. And, uh, yeah, then it just transpired and I just started building and wow. you know, figuring out as I went, but that story, it it's was a, it's a great story. Yeah. It sucks so much in the time, but now it's very powerful for me oh to look God. back and, and be like, you know, that was the best thing that maybe ever happened to me. Yeah. Cause it just showed me like it pushed Pushed me over the edge, right? You, you did not feel like painting. No, I did not feel like painting like at all. Well, earlier today, I was telling somebody my story, how I got to entrepreneurship and, but like similar to you, both of my parents were entrepreneurs at certain point in their careers. So, right. I, I saw it inside out, uh, because I was living it. But when I finished college, I was like, what do I do? Well, I was attempting to get a proper job. And pretty much that was the only job that uh, I ever applied to. It was uh, an assistant position in an insurance company, like random insurance company, not even like a good one. Um, and they rejected me. And I was like, I felt so, so bad that for me, that was exactly the same feeling that you describe. 
when you were offered uh, the painting job because I was like, I'm not putting up with this. <laughs> I'm I'm going exactly. on my own. And that's where I get I got together with my co-founders and we started building STRV. Uh but it's it's amazing how you know uh things are very similar that there is like you build up uh to it, but then suddenly there is this like trigger mm. and then it goes straight in. Yeah, I read somewhere. I think it might have been a book called Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. Pretty good book. He was on even Joe Rogan. And, and that's where I think I heard about it. But he talks about actually a lot of people, if they had events like we just had, it would be better for their lives where they have this almost manageable discomfort. Right. So like, say I did get that entry level job, but I hated it, but it'd be like, okay, I'm gonna, getting a good salary. Maybe I'm still working up, but it's like, it's not what I'm truly meant for, but by just going painting or insurance. And it's such just like a slap in the face. It pushes us to that other edge. And it's like, if more people had actually things like that happen, it'd actually be better for them. And it's people say that with like girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever it is too, where it's like, there's some discomfort, but not enough where you're like, oh, this is okay. But it actually be better if they just like did something crazy. So then you just moved on. Um, so it's just interesting stuff there. Well, you you got to uh, get that slap in the face and then uh, it sets you on the right direction. Exactly. And like, uh, so so that, that was the inception to really do something of your own. But uh, uh, did, you, did you like ever think about continuing the journey as an athlete or what was the trigger for the transition from, from, from that to yeah. finally doing it? No, that's a good question. I, so name, image, and likeness, which I'm not sure if your audience is familiar with this at all, but I'll just give a brief overview in case they aren't, but NIL name, image, and likeness hit college sports. So now college athletes, amateur athletes can make money off their, you know, name, image, and likeness. So endorsement yeah. deals, sponsors, but there's these collectives and third party groups that came. So they're now paying athletes and it's kind of like salaries for athletes. It's a loophole, but anyway, that's this whole huge, massive, it's going to be a hundred billion dollar industry over the next probably 10 years. It's massive. But anyway, that went into effect. So I could have now started making money as uh, just through NIL. And I had a decent social following at the time. So that weighed into, into the decision because we had a COVID year. So I played four years at BU. Now they granted us a fifth year. NIL is coming. I could have went and played in Europe. So that's on the table. And so I really thought about it. Do I want to come back for a fifth year? Do I want to transfer maybe to a different school? Do I want to go to Europe? But I had built in college this this business my sophomore year i started building it called college athlete insight and it was all around helping families and high school athletes get recruited to go to college so i built a whole website and this is where i learned a ton and uh built, wrote an ebook that still it's like 10 to 15 copies still sell a month for me and i haven't touched that website in probably three or four years it's crazy it's really really cool but, uh, and, and that showed me the, the value of passive income as well. Of like, you can go and build something and then you can benefit from it from a long time for a long time. And, uh, my Twitter started growing. And so I just decided, I don't know really how I'm going to make money. The painting thing happened somewhere in that, uh, sequence as well, but I'm going to figure it out. And it, and my whole basis on everything is media is one of the most powerful things that ever existed, especially with social media and personal branding. And you can reach thousands of people with a message that feels one-on-one -on -one and relates. So I, I went on Twitter, did a lot of athlete business content, built a ton of relationships with athletes, agents, business partners on that side. And then I said to monetize, I need to go to the other side. And, and that's when I really started to grow the business of Profluence, which, uh, and Profluence stands for, to it, the, there's a definition of the word, it's to tell a story in an abundant moving way. So it's to me, like I'm always telling stories and I'm trying to do it in an abundant way. And it's like opportunity to opportunity, chapter to chapter. It's kind of like, there's two definitions of it. So um, that was kind of when I came up with the name of the business and I created websites, started going on LinkedIn, podcast, all this other, and uh, sat in the middle. And uh, at that point I realized, yeah, there's, like I'm doing this. There, there's no point for me to try to pursue sports athletics anymore in a competitive standpoint or a money professional standpoint. I still love the golf. I did a triathlon last year. I play tennis every now and then I go to the gym or run every day. Like I'm always doing stuff. 
I think that's super important, but I'm not, uh, you know, pursuing professional athletics anymore. Well, you are on a different path now uh, with uh, Profiland Sports. So uh, what uh, do you see as your vision for, for the company? What would you like to build? Yeah, I call it a, I call it a flywheel. Um, I know that's sometimes an overused word or mistaken, but like I'm trying to create this massive flywheel throughout athletics using the power of media agency and uh, venture to uh, come together into this ecosystem, right? So we own narratives through ourselves. We own narratives through people we work with on the agency or partnership side. And then we also own it through actual ownership into investing into companies. And uh, I, I think that is the ultimate model that we can just keep leveraging up and up and up from hopefully smaller startups or smaller athletes, whatever, to some of the biggest athletes, biggest brands, biggest uh, teams or whatever. Uh, so that, that's the, the ultimate vision is to take these flywheel and, you know, build more flywheels within them and, and create a, a pr really powerful profluence ecosystem. I call it the uh, web of connect, the web of connectivity. Uh, and it's just, that's one of the slides on, on, one, on a bunch of my, we, you know, in our business, I'm sure you too, there's so many decks that we have, where there's like a million. So I have that in the slide and, and basically every one I have. Yeah. Uh, of our ecosystem that's that's what i'm trying to create where did the idea come from that this is uh how you would like to structure it when it comes to connecting the power of media and like connecting with 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 a lot of other things that are complementing it as well uh you do the podcast you have right. a newsletter built around the community uh, you have uh, an investment fund uh, as part of uh, the portfolio as well uh, how did it all connect together? Yeah, Luba, I mean, it's, I, I really pride myself in researching and looking at what else is out there. I think I have a good eye of seeing 17 different things taking place and going, you know, what does this mean? And a lot of that's actually stemmed from research and writing articles and having podcasts and getting these insights and started to like see common trends of things that work. And you just, you know, pull what you like out and, and apply and you remove what you don't like. And, uh, also at the end of the day, it's all about people. Uh, so I've met a lot of the right people. Uh, you know, some people call it destiny, fate, whatever. Like there's just been opportune times where I've met the right person or right people at the right time. And it's spurred other actions of business. Like right now we're, we're also in the process of building out some event infrastructure You know, I, and that wasn't ever on my roadmap. I would never have told you a year ago, two years ago, oh, we want to be putting on events or hosting these or selling them to brands as a part of this. But it's like, you know, we re met the right person and they told us what they're doing and we told them what we're doing and it fits. And, and so we partnered and, you know, we got some of that going on now. So to me, it's just be, be passionate about, about our vision. And then, you know, when the right people come in, that's what I love about flywheels too. There's always somewhere to place them. You can always add value to someone else and they, whatever they have their skill sets, they can always add value to you and uh, the web of connectivity right there in, in action and globally as well. I, I see Profluence globally. We have some interesting initiatives uh, looking at companies internationally, but also We have advisors all over the world and uh, even looking at some joint ventures on the media side to uh, build little little media slash like investment angles as well. Uh, uh, India's the, the one I'll, I'll say, but there's a few other uh, areas around the world we're looking at also. Oh, I bet there's a lot of stuff happening all over the place. Uh, and you have pretty much built a, a one man media empire uh, and the. Uh, You also had several discussions about uh, the media outlets buying you out. Uh, uh, so it uh, must be appealing to them. Uh, why did you decide that was not uh, the right uh, path for, for you? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I did. I, I've had three to four now at this point. Uh, and they just weren't the right offer. And also, like I said, was starting back at the beginning of this whole podcast. Like I want to control my day. I want to control my destiny. I want to build it how I want to build it. And when you give up that ownership, you know, you fall under someone else's vision, you fall under their flywheel or ecosystem or whatever they call it. And, and I didn't want that to happen because I've view what we're building is very valuable and, uh, the top layer, not us at the bottom of someone else's. And, uh, 
Yeah. So that, that was really the main driving force. I mean, if, to be honest, if the offer was good enough, especially at certain points, I probably would have taken it, but also looking back blessing in disguise of like that, they weren't the right offer and that I didn't take it because we've just kept building on top. And, uh, so, so we've done some interesting things. We've folded part of the, the media brand. And like you said, it, it, from the external perspective, it does seem like a one man show with me. There's some purpose behind that, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes, both, you know, full and part time and uh, partners in certain ventures as well. And, you know, even on the venture side, my, my partner, you know, he's, uh, raised billions of dollars in his career, built a bunch of funds and stuff. So we have really good people involved that we haven't per se released, uh, publicly yet. Um, you know, a lot of people privately or behind the scenes may know. And, uh, yeah, we've done some interesting things. Like we're, we're, we folded part of the media into the fund. We are we're looking at that on the agency side. So we're trying to make sure everything is uh, feeding each other and complementary. So, uh, yeah. What has been the toughest moment for you so far, uh, when it comes to building up the business? Man, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree <laughs> with my answer here. The toughest thing is I want to move fast, man. I want to move. Like I got it. I know where it's all headed. I know what opportunities to jump on. But, uh, want someone once told me a, a mentor, everything you want to do is going to take twice as long as you think. And it's going to cost twice as much. And whew, man, I don't know if I can swear, but shit, that is spot on It's spot on. It is not, it's not even spot on. I like uh, these past couple of weeks, I had a little bit of realization that, uh, you know, like the whole past year, I feel like was leading up to some of the like thoughts and decisions that I managed to make in a matter of days, maybe weeks, a couple of weeks And like it, I'm not saying it took me a year, but it's like building up and it's mm. not like you can't move mountains overnight. Uh, and when it comes to like, especially building businesses, it, it's a process and yeah. I can totally relate with uh, what you are saying, because I also like things to happen very fast and many of, uh, My fellow colleagues, uh, hate that, that when <laughs> I, uh, when they ask when something is due and I, to I, I tell them as soon as possible or today or tomorrow, uh, they, they hate that. But, uh, uh yeah, I also, I also have, uh, a little bit of that issue. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I like to, I like to move fast. And so that's a lot of the partners I've tried to go with, but also, as like you'll you probably aware too your colleagues you also need some people that pull you back as well because sometimes you can miss over little things and you got to think structurally and uh so so that's been good and that's something i've definitely learned it's been a challenge for me because even right now there's a sport that i know is about to blow up in the united states it's blown up globally and we own a, a good media asset at the bottom. We own a newsletter and we've partnered with some very, you know, important people and brands on it. But like, I, there's no real league structure in the U S there's not much. And I'm like, I know that's what we is going to happen. I know we could go do it, but it's just like not moving as fast as I like. And then there's some people that just, you know, have billions of dollars that can move really fast and make that happen. So, uh, as we keep building this up, I like it because I think I'm going to be able to keep moving faster and faster as I meet more and more of the right people. And uh, they start to see like, I know where things are going. That's why I've built the media slash it and it's media profluence, but it's also a research arm. We do a lot of research. We put a lot of time and effort into understanding the data and where trends are going. I do it for myself. We have writers, but I also end up editing and writing a lot myself because I want to understand, like if I dive in, like right now I'm diving deep into two areas of sports. No, they're not sexy. So not many people talk about, but like there's such a influx of sports consultants. And then also sports tourism is taking off. You never see anyone talking about that, but I'm diving really deep right now into the numbers and the ecosystem and the space and market maps. And like, I understand it inherently well now. 
And so it's such an advantage uh, for me. And, and then obviously that research and media helps both the fund tremendously from understanding, you know, the landscape and what companies have a great chance to win. But then it also helps the agency side of, uh, you know, knowing where to go find talent or, or build build assets alongside. Are you keeping it a secret what uh, the sport is that, <laughs> that you think is about to blow up? Uh, I, I won't keep it a secret because at this point, you know, there's probably already things in motion and we got things in motion too. But uh, paddle, uh, uh, paddle is about to explode in the US. It's going to be bigger than pickleball in five to seven, 10 years, in my opinion. Yeah, I've, I've done deep dives. We own a good media asset at the bottom of it. So if it does blow up and we don't get the chance to build the league, that's okay because we, we're going to own a good media asset. Uh, but 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 I'd like to own more of the ecosystem. How do you differentiate paddle from pickleball? So paddles has like a, is that a big difference or? Oh uh, yeah, it's it's a big difference. Pickleball is more I call it like an old person, less athletic type sport. It's great, like it, it's blown up. I don't think many people are going to watch it on TV. I think that it's just not that interesting to me. Uh, even though it's the league's done well, they brought in all these athlete investors, and it's worked to grow that the teams went from like a hundred thousand dollars to now $10 million valuations. I don't know what you're buying, but anyway, paddles a lot more exciting, a lot more interesting. You can run around walls. You can hit off walls. Really. You got to be a better athlete. So I think the media and TV appeals certainly there. And then also it's just, if you're slightly a little more physical fit, it's, it's a much more fun sport. And uh, it's not like as demanding as tennis. It's, you know, two on two. So there's team, there's walls, you can hang out. There's uh, some cool stuff. So yeah, I, I made an investment into a, a paddle type thing through our, through our fund as well um, that we're excited about, but there's a much bigger plays at hand there. Paddle, if you're listening, it's, it's going to blow up. So if you own like land or you want to think about a facility, <laughs> uh, you know, We're, we're happy to listen to those conversations, but also, you know, yourselves, uh, it's a good opportunity. There must be something happening because I, I heard about Paddle recently, and that's why I'm glad that I now have you on the podcast. So <laughs> you can educate me more about the differences and uh, maybe I get into uh, the sport as well. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, like as you have something new like this uh, on the rise, that's new opportunity for the people that own real estate, right? To also like think about, mm. oh, what 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 should I uh, put on my land? And uh, yeah, and that's what's cool about our media angle. Like I could put out an art, I did this for pickleball. I put out a pickleball article just about, here's 10 ways you can make money off pickleball. And literally I've never gone through, I don't think I've ever even finished reading all the emails of just people, hey, I own a warehouse or, hey, I want to start a league or, hey, I want to start this or, hey, I have this. Uh, so our, our deal flow is uh, pretty crazy um, from that standpoint. We just see so many opportunities. Um, and that's why we built, started building the investment arm, just to capitalize on some of those. So when it comes to pedal, nothing has really formalized as like an official uh, league or anything like that? Uh, there's a league in the US. Uh, I won't go too deep into it, but there's just, if you look at a lot of the leagues and the reason why Saudi Arabia has made, and the PIF fund has made such strides across sports is these models are just outdated. The operating is not great. And, and uh, paddle, it, it, same thing. It, it, it could use some, some innovation. And, and that's why golf classic example. I think tennis is next. Combat sports is coming. The Saudis have, uh, I've been, I have advisors out in the Middle East as well. They say they're, they're coming after pickleball and paddle. So it's real, man. Sports is, is, is boom and like crazy. And we sit in the middle of a lot of it, which is awesome. It's happening. It's definitely happening. <laughs> it's happening. You, 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 met, you mentioned investing into a uh, battle concept, but uh, oh, you have uh, your own fund. Uh, you mentioned to me that uh, even today you had some successes in terms of securing some uh, more financial resources for the fund. But like, uh, how do you approach uh, investing? What do you look for, and uh, what's the what's the journey on that front? Yeah, it's a good question. So we, uh, you know, obviously built the media assets in the agency first to have like both 
bring in inflow of deal flow and interesting stuff, but also be able to now push forward portfolio companies to place them into strategic things. And I made a bunch of angel investments myself, but I just started to realize like there's a real opportunity and structure here. So we created Profluence Capital off of it. I partnered with a, a guy out in New York City that runs huge private equity and funds and we formalized it and, uh, you know, raising a 25 to $50 million fund out the gate. You know, we, we've done, we, we just launched it a month ago. We've got great initial traction. We uh, closed two investments looking at the next three to four. Uh, and we're looking at early stage sports tech media companies. So ones that fit in that sports thematic view, we've looked at data companies, leagues, teams, uh, and on obviously a lot of merging leagues and, and smaller things like that. The software companies that plug and play NIL, U sports, sports betting, you know, anything that really falls under the, uh, umbrella. And, you know, we're in stealth. I think this is probably the first time I've even talked about it too much publicly, but, uh, you know, we're, we're at a good spot and the traction's really picking up. So there's nothing to hide now. And, and it's really, nothing's changed. Like I, I've been investing and looking at stuff myself and through syndicates for a couple years now. And so now it's just like formalizing it more into a real structure where we can go own more of companies and really push them forward. So, uh, yeah, that's profluence capital and a nut, <laughs> but, uh, always looking for, for new LPs. I'm uh, happy that I'm getting some secrets out of you. No, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, I, I mean, I, one thing I will say is I try to build in public. I can always be better, but my whole thing is like, if you're building cool stuff, the pie is big enough for everyone. I don't think everyone always wants to compete and hold everything secret and act like they have the next greatest thing. Like, listen, like I'm not completely reinventing the wheel. We've we're doing something cool. We put a lot of time and effort. We brought a lot of cool people in, but it's nothing. It's nothing new. And the pie is big enough for everyone. And we add a ton of value and, and you know, we want to play a part in this game and, and others want to, too. And, and we play nice with everyone. That's how we've gotten to this point in, in only a few years. I'd like to take a little pause here and ask you a mindset question uh, because it seems like you are like very passionate about investing and usually uh, people don't get to investing until later in their career, or at least I feel that way. And uh, maybe I'm uh, one of those uh, that took a little bit of time to actually uh, get uh, uh, on that side of uh, of uh, uh, the boat as well. And uh, it seems like you went straight in, like you figured out how to uh, build a good business, make money, but you are immediately uh, <laughs> thinking about where to put it next and how to like escalate it and uh yeah you you call it a flywheel in the end uh but uh i wanted to ask you a little bit about how how did it uh, fall in place that uh you started thinking about okay i i have something that is working i have something that is generating money but uh let's uh look at the ways how I can, I, I can accelerate if I do this and that instead of maybe leveraging uh, that uh, for your own benefit? Hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And uh, I want to start here. So to begin, I didn't need to build like the venture arm of this. I build it because it's a value add to everyone else. Like a lot of people want to build a venture piece to their business because like that's their main thing. Like a lot of people, they just build a media company or they just build an agency or they just build a venture fund. And so they're relying, we need to raise money. We got to do this. So I get paid on my venture fund. I'm building the venture fund to formalize this ecosystem, to be able to bring others into our world and say, listen, I want to give you upside in this as well. I'm not coming to a million people like I used to do on syndicates and stuff. It's just easier formalized. You want to be involved. You want to invest in the companies we're looking at. You see what we have access to. You see the media coming here. And to me, I just love, and now this is more to the mindset part. I love my vision of this and I'm very passionate, passionate about it, as you said, and I dive full in and go hard and grind. And I love it. Like it never feels like I'm working. Cause I like, I enjoy, enjoy it like all around. 
And there's other people that are building the same thing and they feel that same way. And I just love to be able to provide that support and own a piece of it as well and say, listen, I really believe in that person. I really believe in their team, their idea, where they're going, and we can also help them do it. And so for me, you know, I always say I'm really in the business of relationships. That's what we're building. People say, oh, you're media or venture. Or agent. Okay. Yeah. That's a label you want to put on, but we're, you know, it's all of this is people driven. We, you know, together combine, you know, we come together to build this, but then we, uh, you know, we work with others to help them achieve their thing. And to me, that was fun of, I can only take on so many clients on the agency side so it's just another vehicle to help more companies on the capital. And then that allows me to then go hire people to, you know, operate and help those companies more as well. So uh, it just, at the end of the day, like I truly have this vision that sports and business are two of probably the greatest industries. And I know business isn't like per se, just an industry, but like two of the greatest, we'll call them niches in the world of what they can teach you or you call it entrepreneurship or sports or whatever. And they're not too political yet. I know they are getting more, but like you learn so much about yourself, like especially sports, just my, it, you know, it takes a mindset to be really elite. It takes physical acumen to be elite. There's a business aspect of it, of negotiating contracts and deals. There's the people aspect of it. And then there's also like just the spirituality aspect of it. And to me, it's like, we can use sports to make the world better and make a huge impact where, I don't know, maybe a company we invest in, you know, we're looking at some AI stats and video companies right now. Let's say some kid uses that platform because we invested and they had a chance. And now that kid, you know, gets a chance to earn a scholarship. And then because of that, who knows, he goes on to build a huge company or help thousands of kids around the globe. Like we've made a small impact. And I, I just feel that like everything we do, I'm like, we can be making impacts in a good way. And sports is such a natural way to do it. And uh, there's a, there's real monetization and business aspect around sports. Now it's finally like monetizing. People see the, the value of it also. Yeah. There is a lot of opportunities in sports. Uh, no questions about that. And even like many of the podcast guests previously, uh, were coming from the sports industry. And I think that, uh, this is one of the verticals that uh, we feel very strongly about at STRV as well, because yeah. these are extremely fun projects too. And oh, uh, so fun. they are projects with great people and uh, there's there's a lot of happening. And it's, it's a great intersection with technology too, right? We are uh, having these new applications and new pieces of tech that enhance the sport, that uh, enhance the way how we interact, how we entertain ourselves when watching. Uh, uh, I had uh, my good friend Patrick Dees from Fan Controlled Football uh, yep. on the podcast. And uh, it was great to see something extremely new and interesting and how they are shaping the space as well. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, uh, yes, I definitely agree that, uh, there's a lot of happening, uh, in, uh, in that area of the world. Oh yeah. It's, a, it's very exciting. What, uh, I know you have some clients in the sports world. What else, you know, you have any other cool stuff going on on your side from sports standpoint? Yeah. Like uh, when it comes to sports media, we help the athletic to build uh, their entire product, right? That's probably one of uh, the flagship uh, references because we have yep. been with them since, uh, yeah, pretty much the Y Combinator demo um, and uh, almost all the way up to the acquisition. And they have waited uh, for that uh, for quite a while to see that uh, great success. Yeah. Now I just have a, I have a question for you. You don't, you don't have to answer if you don't want, but did you guys have any equity in them from building all their stuff or just strictly, you know, retainer basis throughout their well, career? Well, um, I will tell you one thing. Uh, and uh, like, I'm, I love working for other people. And uh, by that, I mean, it could be for other businesses, right? Helping yeah. them to build their digital products or us building our own products and launching them on the app store uh, for the consumers uh, and end users. And for me, it was never about uh, uh, taking equity and 
getting uh, uh, you know a, a good return on that. I just want to feel that we do the best work possible. Uh, but funny enough, uh, uh, I think we were offered uh, and we didn't go for it as we were in many other cases. And it's just not the business model that we would do because I feel like it also complicates the relationship. If uh, you have it uh, structured in a very clean way, uh, then, you know, all parties are aligned, but suddenly when you start uh, 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 working with sweat equity, uh, it's very hard to put terms on paper. And frankly, what I like to do these days a lot more, and not that I would be doing it that often, uh, but I have done it a couple of times. I like a lot more if I like something, I would invest back into someone we work with, hard yeah. cash, uh, instead of uh, making it uh, an equity deal. Because to me, that aligns the interests, right? I am investing because I like what you are doing. I'm not investing because suddenly we work together. And you are yeah. hiring, uh, you are hiring STRE because you, you love the way how we build our products. And uh, so that that's pretty much how I have it structured in my head. Uh, not that it I could not imagine it to work. And of course, like, uh, have we worked on uh, products that were massively successful, where we would see huge returns? Yes. But uh, at the same time, do I regret? No. Not at all. Well, I, I, as long as the product that we launch is successful, then I'm beyond happy. Yeah, no, it's a good mindset around it. And that's definitely how when I started a lot of around consulting clients, I would, you know, they would pay me a retainer. So view it the same as what you guys would have with the athletic or whatever. And then usually when I was done, I'd be like, hey, you know, I liked what you were doing and I'll put half of back whatever they paid me in to like invest back into them as then, you know, earn a little equity or whatever. So that, right. that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And then, yeah, from our, yeah, our agency perspective, like what we've built is completely different from what you do. We, we work with a lot of like, uh, social media influencers or brands, like more individuals and create like events and activations and sometimes our newsletters. So like completely different from what you do, but we create a lot of the times like 50, 50, uh, partnership equity ownership deals as well. So it's like, they don't have to pay us like to, to just do set this all up for them, but then we have to go sell and bring money in for both. So like there, there's no perfect model in, in the whole agency world, but yeah, I know like, you have, that's a good perspective around it. I was just curious because I know the athletic was like a $500 million yeah. acquisition or something like that. And I can imagine that, uh, in the future of SDRV, there will be times where we will want to risk more and where we'll be happy to take more responsibility and uh, not just as like a, a little bit of sweat, sweat equity, but building joint ventures, making big bets, picking the right partners for that. This is the direction that I would definitely like to be pushing because I feel like there is huge opportunities, but uh, this is not what we are talking about here, right? This is more about like, uh, give us a little discount and uh, we'll, we'll give you some shares mm -hmm. back. Uh, and to me, that does not really, that yeah, does plus not so really align, lot, right? Yeah, plus there's some of it out of your control as well. Where, yeah, there's the athletic, but there's probably a ton of other brands you've helped that, you know, the, you know, maybe didn't work out. And so it's like, then that equity is worth nothing. So equity, yeah, I always say it, uh, it's one of the, sh it's such a funny capitalism, us type based thing where it's like, Hey, work for free. We'll give you this, a maybe imaginary future gain that could be worth a lot, but we're not going to pay you up front. It's such like a balance, uh, but it moves people, man. It, it you know having a piece of a potential future pie moves people. It's interesting. Yeah, I, w I wanted to also ask you, like, how do you think it's beneficial to combine many aspects of what you do from like being an athlete or like at least used to being an athlete, uh, uh, being a creator, 
uh, founder, consultant, and investor. That's a lot of hats. Uh, not that I would not be wearing many hats too, but uh, I would like to ask uh, your perspective on splitting uh, time between many of these areas and how they either complement each other, which I assume is the case, or mm. how they uh, make things difficult. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Everything's a balance, I believe. And actually, so a trait of me that if someone would ever ask me, I don't know if I'll ever be really in an interview seat or giving someone my resume. But if a question was like, what is your weakness? Mine would be, I get bored with things quickly. I just know that about myself. And so how I've shaped everything in our business, even though a lot of it is actually the same thing, it always feels different to me because either on the media side, I'm researching something completely different. Obviously, on the investing side, always looking at different things on the agency or consulting, advising side, different things. And then also have having really smart partners that fill voids or gaps in between all of that really helps. So, yeah, it might look like all of that, but they all combine. And truthfully, a lot of people actually are more than they think. Right. Like I can say, you know, founding this and investing, but it's like, yeah, okay. Like, so is anyone that founded a venture thing. They're also a founder and a, and a, you know, advisor. And so they're actually like all, you know, a lot of them are just wording. Uh, They all fall very tightly together. It's just, I push more public, right? We've pushed our media public, but there's a lot of investors or agency people that have all that information, do all that research, but they own it in the back end. And they're like, no one should ever see this. And I'm like, listen, This is what I learned. These are the interesting companies that I see here it is world. And then that's had a lot of value and it's helped build other things. So I'm all about just whatever I do, if I'm putting in the time and work, I might as well make it public and put it out there and do it. And so, you know, it's, uh, it might seem like a lot, but I I guarantee you there's uh, you know, I was just talking to a buddy that, that works at BlackRock and he's, uh, I just, I'm 25, he's 25 He's in his uh, third year and he's like, yeah, dude, I'm working like a hundred hour weeks, financial analyst grinding. And I'm like, listen, I'm building a lot of cool stuff. In my opinion, I'm not working anywhere close to that. So, you know, it might seem like different hats, but it's actually, I've balanced it very well and they coordinate very well. And a lot of the times I'm crossing off multiple boxes at the same time. I'm so happy for having this discussion because I feel like there is a lot of similarities between our personalities. Yeah. Um, I also realized that I need to do multiple things. So I keep myself busy and engaged. Mm -hmm. And if I do only one, it's uh, not going to be enough and I'll get bored. At the same time, if I do way too many, then I will become hugely overwhelmed and it will start impacting (laughs) everything that I do. So, uh, again, I can totally relate. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, at one point I was like, I tried to even add videos and doing like, try to be more of a creator just because people, and, and that's when I got overwhelmed and I was like, okay, that's not important. So to me, it's always, and I'm sure you do the same thing, trying to, step back and take a day and and bring out the notepad and, you know, uh, really think through like, what is everything I'm doing? What are the most important things? What can I cut? What can I add in my line? And I'm doing that all the time. And then, and then you just put your head down and go. And right now, so I know my days, I'm getting a LinkedIn post up. I'm getting a Twitter post up. I know I'm, you know, reviewing the newsletter for Wednesday and Friday. I know I'm checking with my VA to make sure our schedule's good. You know, I'm making sure when I'm looking at decks or, or relationships or handling LPs is in this time segment. I know there's this open gap where new people that reach out, I can fit into. And it's very routine based and disciplined, but it's every day is kind of the same, but also like all those conversations and research and content is different. So it, uh, it works nicely um, well, for me. Based on what you just said, it seems like you have your schedule very nicely structured. Yeah. I mean, people will be like, uh, even for me, like when I host my podcast, like it's two or three Eastern time, unless, you know, I'll make exceptions if you're from a different country and the time zones are a little messed up. But like, even me, like, it's like, no, that's where it fits in my schedule. Like if it doesn't fit in yours then let's do it a different week where it does fit. Like I'm not, I don't try not to move things around too much. It just, 
I don't like that. I like going to the gym at 10 in the morning. I like waking up, doing my media and content stuff, and then going to the gym at 10. And so when someone's like, I want to call it 10, it messes everything up because then I got to like really shift. I I have something to learn from this. I love <laughs> going to the gym at 11, uh, but I can rarely make it at 11, unfortunately. I like for <laughs> me, like I know what my ideal day would look like, but it's uh, relatively hard to stick my with my ideal day every day yeah no trust me it's it's definitely hard like to uh, i'm i'm you know i'm lying to myself on this own podcast today i'd even get it 10 because i just had a million different things and, and i mentioned before but like we landed a new client i was doing some lp stuff and you know a new investor and so it didn't happen but it's okay because when i go and do my workout later i'll be happy because i'll be like oh yeah look, look what we did at that time period i was supposed to go so uh yeah it's all good man balance routine yeah. so it's all about squeezing it uh squeezing in a workout somewhere is uh definitely important oh yeah got and to like, just you know uh, you are 25 uh a uh, lot of energy a lot of power uh but you are still being very mindful of uh you know, keeping everything balanced and uh, doing uh, hopefully all the right things. Was it always like that? Or did you also have some realizations on those fronts? Yeah, I, uh, no, nah, there's definitely been realizations. I was, I won't get into all the stories, but I, I mean, I was definitely a little, I, I had a, you know, crazy high school years and, you know, doing whatever and getting in trouble and doing all kinds of stuff. And, college was good. And then I, I don't know. It's like almost like you wake up one day, like you live this whole life. And then I don't know if it's like consciousness fully comes in or, or what it is. Um, you know, I've had some just experiences, uh, as well, where you just kind of, you know, start to realize the meaning of stuff and, and, uh, yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely wasn't always like this. And I'm sure I'll look back in another five years and be like, man, I was, I didn't, what, like, <laughs> what, what? Uh, but, but really to me, it's just like, I'm just curious and I'm always trying to find, I'm trying to find more about myself, about life, earth, why we're here, why things happen the way they happen. And just, I follow that. And so to me, it's, you know, I have my staple, like every day I, I meditate for 10 minutes and I haven't missed that in two years now. And, uh, two years straight. Yeah. Two years straight. I've, I've got like my whole thing, but you wow. got to even go back. Another layer of that is because that's, I read a book called the compound effect and it said like, it takes 18 months to really like actually see all the benefits from something, but you got to do it every day. You don't got to meditate for an hour every day. You, you don't want to overwhelm. So to me, 10 minutes is perfect. And I've never, I've done five minutes and then I moved up to 10 and I've never, I don't really plan to go more or less. Like it just fits perfectly. I do it after I shower at the gym. It's built into my routine and it's great. But to me, like reading has opened everything up and I would urge everyone and I, my cousins, my brothers, everyone, I'm always like read books. You don't, a lot of them all point to similar truths. Like even if you look at religions, all of them, you know, whatever your beliefs are, they all point to very similar things. And like that's why you need to read and, and see what other smart people and, and whether it's in business or whatever, you know, I'm all about like just always trying to read and learn from others that have done what I'm trying to do or have realized what I'm trying to realize and, and then implementing them. You know, people, a lot of people read all these books and here's a hundred books I read this year, picture, they look cool. But I'm like, I want to read a book and I want to take one thing from it. And now I'm actually at the point in my life where it's very hard for anyone to get me to read a new book. I just read the same ones now over and over uh, every year. And I just have my little, cause I'm like, they're all these self-help books. They all like say the same thing in different ways. So I've just like found the ones that help me the most. And I just read those, you know, and I, you can read them a little faster, skip parts. Cause you know, you've done it before. And, uh, do you do physical books or audio books. I'm, I'm a physical book person. I don't know why audio books just don't, they don't and, work for me. And like, as you read it over and over again, do you always find something new? always find something new and the craziest book ever i'll say it, like i read it i've read it every year i've actually read it twice this year it's called the power of now by eckhart toll and it's all just about being present in the moment and you just you just become aware of like the here and now and 
and Matt, because your whole life happens in the now, like we're always thinking about the past or always thinking about the future, but everything actually happens in the now. And if you're super focused on the now, you'll actually optimize it with whatever you're doing, lifting or having a podcast or researching, whatever it is, like be fully in it. And I'm still terrible at it. Like I'm still, I'm getting better and better every day, but that book just opened up everything to me. Cause it just like taught me to maximize each moment instead of like lollygagging, thinking about everything. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a journey, man. I'm trying to enjoy it, but even myself, you know, I, I, I get ahead and, uh, you know, you start thinking about where you're going to be or want to be. Um, but I'm also like everything in my life I've wanted to happen has happened. Maybe not the way I thought or wanted, but like it has happened. Like I really want to be a D one athlete. Like it happened. I wanted to own my business. It happened. I wanted to have a venture fund. It's happened. So it's like, okay, I know what I want now still in the future, but like come back to the now and enjoy it because then once you get there, it's going to be the next thing. Um, and, it's always the next thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm getting I'm, my Buddha nature to come out slowly day by day, but I'm uh, trying, I'm trying as well. We are, we are similar. In yeah. That. No, it's, it's awesome though. It's awesome. How did you perfect your sense of, uh, community building? Because, uh, I feel you have uh, a special twist to it. Yeah. I mean, kind of relating back to the, the beginning, I try to reach everyone. I would try to like get to you and how you're feeling. And also, especially just in the way I write or communicate, I, I like, I mean, it's just the truth. Like our attention spans these days, they, they suck there. And we all have short attention spans and we're, we're dragged all over. But to me, it's like, if you want to build, you got to add value to others. And so to me, it's also, it's always been about okay, well, let me give you the best research report so you don't have to go do it, right? Um, and then also then it's like, when I meet you, how can I help you? You know, who who can I introduce you to? What can I tell you? Whatever it is. And, you know, that compounds and word of mouth spreads and, and you know, I, it's not easy to help everyone anymore because I just got a lot of people, but like I've, everyone in the beginning I've helped. And then you just start to, you start to connect deeper with people And you start to see people and how they move and you like how they move or you see their skill set and what they're really good at. And uh, you just build around them and uh, and you learn from them. And, and, you know, I'm okay. Like I, I can walk into a room and talk to a lot of people. Like I said, I'm curious. I want to learn. Like I'm in the gym. I'm. It's hard for me to list sometimes because like everyone wants to talk to me now because I just, you know, talk to people and ask them how they're doing because um, I'm curious. But, uh, you know, one of, one of the guys I, I do a lot with, he's just the best in the world I've ever seen of like going in a room and just like learning everything about you, not telling too much about himself, but then adding so much value. because he can just, he can just connect dots like crazy. And he's been on flights and he, you know, he met the CEO of like capital one. And then all of a sudden the next week he's golfing with them or her, I can't remember on the go. Like, he's just so good. And so like, I've attached to people like that, where I see like, he has such a skill set. How can I be around that person, build with them help? Because they have something that I can never, I can never do, I can get better at, but I just want those people around me. So that's how I view community building. And there's the same thing. Some people are really good at sales. Some people are really good at project management. I've just tried to find those people and, uh, and build some are through partnerships. Some are, you know, on sal like, you know, salary or contract contracting, you know, deals. It's, it's you, you figure it out, but, uh, just value. That's what I try to think about. Well, I had uh, like, I think I had uh, a real uh, uh, opportunity here to be the one to ask you a lot of questions and learn uh, from uh, your experience and the, the way how you think about things, because I I feel it's uh, very insightful and uh, there is a lot to take away from that. But for you, like if, if you would, if nothing else and you... Uh, should name two or three things that you would uh, like the audience to remember the most out of uh, uh, our entire discussion, what would it be? Yeah. Well, the first I'll just say, uh, this has been awesome. So thanks, Lou. That's not the first. <laughs> we'll actually say three. That's the first. Thanks for having me. Uh, but two is, you know, they always say like, actually, when you give all these insights, you're the one that needs them the most. Like, I, I think I apply these insights, but it's just funny. They always say like what you're telling others, you need to be applying to. And, and I feel like I am. So, you know, take all those, they've helped me, but also I need, you know, I'm not perfect on any of them either. And then the third is, you know, profluence.com. That's where everything is. And, you know, at the intersection of sports tech and media, that's where we operate. And we got a bunch of cool things going on. And, you know, I answer apetcash at profluence.com. I answer all my emails or DMs, 
Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're always looking for companies and people to work with and cool things to do, but it's a, you know, we call it a media fueled venture flywheel. That's, that's what it is. Profluence. That's what it is. Amazing. Thank you so much for hopping on the podcast, uh, and, uh, walking us through your journey and the way how you think about the future of sports and media. And, uh, I'll be looking forward to catch you next time. Thanks, Luba. I appreciate you having me. It was awesome. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope it can only mean one thing. You liked it. And if you did, please go ahead and follow, subscribe or write us a review and we'll be tremendously appreciated by our side. In the meantime, there are a lot of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.